Okay, so welcome back to the Oxford Discrete Maths and Probability Seminar. Um, it's a great pleasure to have Jacques Verstreiter, uh, who's going to talk about recent progress in Ramsey theory. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you very much for the invitation to uh, give a talk in this uh, wonderful seminar. Um, as Alex said, I'm going to be talking about some recent progress in Ramsey theory. Um, I'm not sure what the usual protocol is, but if you do want to ask a question, I have no, absolutely no problem with the sort of raise your hand tool in, uh, in Zoom. Uh, interrupt me anytime if something isn't clear. Uh, so I'm going to try to give a gentle sort of introduction and some motivation for what I'm going to speak about, some introduction to Ramsey theory, uh, followed by perhaps a little bit of uh, light uh, uh, proofs of some of the results. Uh, and I'll end with some open problems. So the structure of the talk is going to be as follows. Uh, here's the outline. So I will talk about classical Ramsey theory. I'll say a word or two about random graphs. And then I'll say a, a, a sort of shift in direction to pseudo-random graphs, which gives some new results on Ramsey numbers. I'll say something about this uh, new result on R4T, which is a Ramsey number. Uh, on erdosh rogers functions, and then, as I said, I will end with some open problems. So let's begin then. Um, the general sort of loose philosophy behind Ramsey theory is that in any sufficiently large structure, there's a relatively large uniform substructure, um, or perhaps some people rather say perfect disorder is mathematically impossible. But these are things that I'd like to sort of quantify a little bit in this talk. And these things are quantified by Ramsey numbers. So essentially for two integers s and t, at least two, we let r of s t denote this uh, Ramsey number, which is the minimum number n, uh, such that no matter how you color the edges of a complete graph with n vertices red and blue, you're guaranteed to get either a red ks or a blue kt. So here, Kn denotes the complete graph of order n. So this is, in some sense, a generalization of the pigeonhole principle that uh, in these large complete graphs, no matter how you color, you get these monochromatic substructures. These are the classical Ramsey numbers uh, defined uh, almost 100 years ago, uh, actually by a logician, Frank Ramsey, um, but since, of course, combinatorics has uh, taken the reins. And uh, so just to give you a feeling for what these numbers actually are, R of 2T um, is T. Simply, if you, again, use the definition, you color a complete graph of order T. If there's a red edge, then that is the significance of the 2 there. That's a red K2. Whereas if there is no red edge, well, then, of course, all the edges are blue, and the entire thing is a blue kt. So clearly, r of 2t is t. Were it nice that all the Ramsey numbers were that easy to uh, dispense with, they are not. So let's do a little example. r33 is perhaps the most famous motivating example for Ramsey numbers. Uh, what we want to show is that it's 6, which is the same as saying, first, try to find a coloring of a complete graph on five vertices without any monochromatic triangles. There's only one coloring there it is. It has no monochromatic triangle, right? no red triangle, there's no blue triangle. So you color a red pentagon and a, and a blue pentagram, and that gives you a, a lower bound, which is R33 is bigger than five, right? So it can't be five because of this example. On the other hand, it can't be more than six, because if you try to color red and blue, the edges on six vertices, you know you're going to find, if you pick any vertex, at least three edges of the same color, right? Because there are five edges sticking out of every vertex. So three of them at least better have the same color. Let's say they're red. Now, if those three are red, that's guaranteed to happen. Um, if you see a, any red edge between two neighbors of that vertex, of course, there is a red triangle. So you can assume that doesn't happen. And therefore, between all the neighbors, you have blue edges, which is itself a blue triangle. 
And so that's that's a little proof that R33 is at most six. And in fact, that is what lies behind a general upper bound on these Ramsey numbers. It isn't clear a priori that these Ramsey numbers even exist. It requires a proof to show that R of ST is actually bounded as a function of S and T. As I said, moreover, these uh, classical Ramsey numbers are kind of hard to come by. Um, these are the only ones that are known uh, where the first parameter is three. So triangle versus clique, um, these are the only uh, six others that are known. Uh, so R310, for example, is open. Um, so those are the R3s, and the R4 is even worse. Um, there's only two of them known. R44 goes back to the 1950s, um, and we'll come back to that one uh, later on in the talk. And R45, well, it's 25. This was determined by uh, Brendan McKay et al. Um, and uh, unfortunately, there's no particularly nice rhyme or reason when you see the graphs that, uh, that show you that it's not 24. Uh, in fact, this R45, uh, there are more than 30,000 graphs which witness R45 is at least 25. Um, there's the witness for R34, right? That's a coloring of uh, on eight vertices that shows that R34 is not eight. That's a nice one. Um, R44 is 18. Turns out to be a nice one too. And as I said, we'll come back to that one. There's uh, some algebra behind that one. But R45, well, I actually couldn't find any pictures uh, anywhere. And so I had to uh, code it up myself. And well, there is an example. And, uh, you know, clearly there's no uh, red K4 or blue K5, right? Everybody can see it immediately. Well, good luck. Uh, R45 happens to be 25 and no others are known after that. Um, R46 is not known and saliently R55 is not known either. So the erdos sekeres theorem tells you these, these numbers actually do exist. Here is an upper bound on Ramsey numbers, which is recursive. Um, you can prove this fairly easily by induction. And in fact, the proof is exactly the same argument, essentially, as the uh, pictorial proof I gave you for R33. It's essentially chasing colors in the neighborhood of a vertex. So these numbers, RST in general, are at most S plus T minus 2, choose S minus 1. It goes back to 1935. Uh, and if you want to be rough about it, that's less than, say, T to the S minus 1. So if you fix uh, S, then these Ramsey numbers are no more than a polynomial of degree S minus 1 in T. And in fact, you can improve that a little bit by a polylogarithmic factor. Um, this follows from results of Scherer and Aitai, Komnosh, and Samaradi, uh, and it was uh, proved with this uh, particular neat constant of one by Li, Rousseau, and, and Zhang in, in the 1990s. And so, uh, yeah, you save a logarithmic factor over that polynomial upper bound that I gave before. So, um, this comes up in a lot of places, these Ramsey numbers, uh, certainly in combinatorics, that's where I'm going to mention it, um, comes up in this problem of uh, determining maps, maximum sets of points in the plane with no k in convex position, permutations of n letters with no monotone subsequence of length k, unit distance graphs, sets with no three-term progressions, and that one we will come back to, embeddings of metric spaces with low distortion, in fact, that's an entire area. Uh, it's called metric Ramsey theory, which is fascinating. Uh, sets of points in the square with no triangles of small area. This is sometimes called the Erdős Heilbronn problem. It's uh, a fiendishly difficult problem. Um, grid points with no three on a line. That's a pretty famous one. Uh, the no three in a line problem. Uh, Roth's theorem and arithmetic progressions of primes, random graphs, percolations, cellular automata, the orchard planting problem, and so on. So I'm not going to go on about all these problems. Um, let me mention, though, there is a lower bound for 
some Ramsey numbers. So this is, uh, in other words, trying to find a construction, right, of a coloring uh, of a large complete graph. And there is one of order about t squared over four log t, say, uh, that gives a lower bound on R3t. Uh, and uh, this was first established uh, using a, a, a randomized greedy algorithm, essentially, the random triangle-free process in random graphs by Zhang Han Kim in 95. Uh, followed by uh, the more general work of Bowman and Kivash. Uh, and the current uh, uh, state of the art appears to be the work of Bowman and Kivash and also Fizz Pontiveros, Griffiths, and Morris, uh, who showed uh, uh, that R3t is at least some very nice constant times t squared over log t. And uh, this is compared to the upper bound, which I mentioned before which was about t squared over log t. So there is a constant factor gap between the lower and upper bound, even for R3t. Since we can't determine these numbers uh, easily, it makes sense to consider uh, what happens for large values of t in the asymptotic sense. And so in fact, uh, these no Ramsey numbers R3t are the only Ramsey numbers whose order of magnitude is known. In other words, up to a constant factor. Okay. So the next one, of course, is R40. Uh, I took this from a page of a book, Adrush on Graphs. Uh, this was asked a long time ago as to whether R40 behaves as the upper bound uh, would suggest in the adrush sekeresh theorem. So you remember I mentioned that uh, in general, RST has an upper bound, which is a polynomial of degree s minus one in t. And so for R40, this would suggest a cubic polynomial upper bound uh, that could be matched by some lower bound, and that's the conjecture of Erdős. And uh, so in fact, that is the case. Um, up to logarithmic factors, uh, this Ramsey number R40 indeed does have order uh, not far from t cubed. Uh, more importantly, the proof of this result is uh, fairly general and applies to uh, give lots of other uh, results, which I will mention throughout the talk. So I am going to say something about this proof. It kind of does give a new uh, uh, direction to uh, constructive bounds on, on Ramsey numbers. In particular, um, I like to say it this way, there's a kind of philosophy that good Ramsey graphs, in fact, hide inside uh, pseudo-random graphs. So I'll, I'll make that uh, less vague uh, as the talk goes on. Uh, let me mention, uh, if you are not a mathematician or interested in more popular articles, there's a bunch of popular articles uh, explaining uh, some of this, uh, which you can read in some of these uh, locations. Um, and in fact, it kind of amazes me um, what is written about some mathematical papers. And in particular, this R4T paper. Um, apparently, I determined R3T more than 90 years ago, according to one article, which uh, I think is a truly impressive feat since I wasn't, well, well, I wasn't even born yet. That, that's probably the most amazing theorem of the talk, that I, I proved something 90 years ago. Okay. Um, and here's another one. I, 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 I you know, apparently, um, the theorem says something about parties. So, so maybe this is the most important theorem of the talk, is that a, a party is made up of a good mix. A good party has a good mix of people. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I I feel like this should be a theorem. Uh, I'm not sure it's publishable, but uh, apparently it's a it's a, it's a it's a theorem. So there we go. Uh, I didn't know how I'd prove this, but uh, I'll try to uh, apply it. Okay. So enough about parties. The first place one might look, and indeed that people did look for uh, Ramsey constructions, is uh, the Erdős uh, Renyi model of random graphs. So this is simply, you know, you have n vertices and you place edges independently with some probability p, uh, independently for different edges, and that produces a random graph. 
And uh, just for notation, we'll say that an event AN, uh, let's say in this random graph model, GNP, occurs asymptotically almost surely if the probability of AN goes to one as N goes to infinity. So you assume you have a bunch of probability spaces indexed by a number N, uh, or a single probability space with events AN in it, and, uh, and that's what asymptotically almost surely means. And so the first place, as I said, you might want to look for Ramsey numbers is uh, random graphs. Um, you'd want to look at the event that this uh, GNP does not have a clique on independent set of size some number t, right? Uh, and here, the edge probability will be one half, so equally likely to be red or blue. And a short computation, if n is larger than square root 2 to the t, due to Erdős, this is one of the first applications of the probabilistic method, shows that the probability that you have a clique or independent set of size t actually goes to zero uh, if n is bigger than square root 2 to the t. So this is to say, asymptotically almost surely, you do not have a clique or independent set of size t in gn1 hat. And so, of course, that means you have a witness, right? You have a, you have a graph. There is a graph with n vertices, n larger than root 2 to the t, with no clique or independent set of size t. I mean, this is what the probability looks like, decays very, very quickly. Um, so there's an example. I just generated one that, that seems to give something. Um, so how, how, how good is this? Well, you can immediately do better. Um, if you're versed in the probabilistic method, you could actually say, well, I will allow some cliques and independent sets, but I will only allow a few of them and then delete one vertex from each of them in order to destroy them. So you can allow in these bad events as long as you can destroy them. And in particular, the expected number of vertices left after you destroy those uh, cliques is the quantity written there, n minus 2 times 2 to the minus t choose 2, n choose t. And of course, that is valid uh, for any values of n and t, and so you can optimize. And that gives a slightly better bound. Right? It's, it allows you to slide in a t over e in this lower bound on these Ramsey numbers r, t, t. Now, one can do even better than that using a slightly more sophisticated tool known as the Lovas local lemma, and that is the limit of the current knowledge for the lower bounds on these Ramsey numbers. And uh, shamefully, I should have stated it, I thought I had, there was a recent m m major breakthrough in the upper bound on these Ramsey numbers, which is to say the erdos sekeresh theorem predicts something like 4 to the t as an upper bound for these Ramsey numbers r, t, t. Uh, it was recently proved uh, that something like 3.99999 to the t is an upper bound. That was something that was sought after for a long time and finally uh, finally was done. So nobody really knows how these Ramsey numbers should behave, uh, these diagonal Ramsey numbers. So we're going to focus on these off-diagonal Ramsey numbers, R of ST, the classical Ramsey numbers. So that's all I'm going to say about the diagonal ones. Let me move on to a different way of uh, perhaps making some constructions. So, of course, any graph has an adjacency matrix where you put a 1 in position ij for an edge ij and a 0 in position ij if there's no edge. So you could, for example, make a picture like this, starting from that graph, make the adjacency matrix. And, uh, of course, the adjacency matrix has uh, real eigenvalues because it's symmetric, right? This relation of adjacency in a graph is symmetric, so the adjacency matrix is symmetric which means the eigenvalues are real. So in the case of random graphs, we know what these eigenvalues might look like. Uh, they follow with appropriate scaling uh, something called Wigner's semicircle law. Um, so we saw that random graphs might be usable for lower bounds for Ramsey numbers, but it makes sense that if you want to construct a, uh, a coloring of a large clique without large red and blue sub cliques that your coloring maybe should look a little random, right? There should be some sort of uniform distribution of edges of each color. And so that's why I, I mentioned the eigenvalues of random graphs. 
Um, because if you have a deregular graph, you could look at the real eigenvalues. And it turns out what really matters um, to test whether the graph kind of looks random is the absolute value of the modulus of all the eigenvalues except the largest, right? Clearly, the largest eigenvalue in a deregular graph is D, right, with a constant eigenvector. But all the other eigenvalues, uh, they might be far away from D, and the further the away they are from D, the more pseudo-random the graph is. So we'll call a graph lambda pseudo-random if all the eigenvalues except the largest have modulus uh, at most lambda. Now, the Olan bopana theorem actually says that you can't go too far down um, if the diameter of the graph is not, say, one or two or three, um, then in fact you get a lower bound on this uh, quantity lambda that looks about two times squared d minus one. There's some famous graphs whose lambdas are at most two times squared d minus one called Ramanujan graphs. And so why are these things called pseudo-random? Well, this bound, by the way, I should mention, comes the, perhaps the quick high-level way to say it is it comes from interlacing and the fact that the infinite DRE tree is a universal cover of deregular graphs. And the eigenvalues of the infinite DRE tree can be computed. But why are these things called lambda pseudorandom? What's this got to do with these graphs looking random? Well, the key thing is that twice the number of edges in any set of vertices in the graph is the inner product of a with the characteristic vector of the set and the characteristic vector of the set, right? So x here is the characteristic vector of the set x. And so when you compute the inner product ax with, a, with x, what you're really doing is you're saying, start in x and take one step and land up back in x, right? That's the significance combinatorially of that inner product. And so therefore you get twice the number of edges in x. So that links the number of edges in a set to the adjacency matrix of the graph in a simple way. And then if you take an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors, everything can be expressed in terms of that, including the characteristic vector of any set X. And so when you compute that in a product, you just get the sum of the eigenvalues times those coefficients of that characteristic vector squared. Right, so sum of lambda i x i squared. As I mentioned that the lambda 1, the largest eigenvalue is d, we can strip it out, move it onto the other side, and you get the following identity. So this relates the deviation of twice the number of edges in a set x from d times the first entry of the eigenvector to some sum of eigenvalues. And so... We know the first eigenvector is constant, right? Remember I said the first eigenvalue is D corresponding to the all one uh, eigenvector uh, normalized. And so what you finally get is this expression here that twice the number of edges in X minus, now you should review this D over NX squared as the expected number of edges in a set that's chosen randomly and uniformly of size X. Okay. So this is measuring the deviation of the number of edges in any set from what you expect it to be. And it's explicitly controlled by that number lambda which we defined before. And that is why these things are called lambda pseudorandom. So there's two examples. Uh, of course, uh, the one on the left is some nice algebraic construction. The one on the right is just some random construction. But both of them are lambda pseudorandom. Uh, whereas, okay, so the one on the right, I won't say much about the one on the left, but the one on the right actually is not very pseudorandom. And the reason is you could just sort of, if I've done it correctly, pick a large set of vertices like that and observe that there are very few edges in there, right? So that would mean. Um, by this deviation of the number of edges on any set, 
this thing better not be very lambda pseudo random. The lambda value better be quite big. So this, the point of this is just to connect the eigenvalues explicitly to the distribution of edges and sets in the graph. That uh, result is called the expander mixing lemma, uh, attributed to Alon and Chong uh, from 1980s. Uh, and it is a very useful and powerful result with many applications, including in computer science. So let's do an example. Um, take a prime number n congruent to 1 mod 4. Let's build a graph. This is a famous graph called the Paley graph. Uh, the vertex set of the graph is, of course, not the numbers from 0 to n. It's from 0 to n minus 1. I'm trying to write down the numbers mod n minus 1 mod n. So from 0 to n minus 1. And uh, right, so an edge will be if the difference of the endpoints is a quadratic residue mod n. And it's not very difficult to see that every edge is an n minus 5 over 4 triangles. Every pair of non-adjacent vertices has a certain number of common neighbors as well, n minus 1 over 4. Um, and uh, these two statistics actually imply that this graph is what is called a strongly regular graph. And what's nice about this is if I've told you how many common neighbors pairs of vertices have, I could write that as a polynomial equation in the adjacency matrix and thereby immediately determine the eigenvalues of the adjacency matrix. And so that's exactly what you can do for this Paley graph. Say P17, let's do an example. For some reason, I keep writing the numbers from 0 up to n. It should be n minus 1. OK, 0 to 16 is the vertex set. Quadratic residues mod 17 define the edges. The graph is clearly 8 regular, right? Half of the numbers are quadratic residues, half of the non-zeros. And uh, using that polynomial equation in the adjacency matrix, there are the eigenvalues. And in fact, this tells you that this value of lambda is 1 plus the square root of 17 over 2, which is quite a bit less than 8, and it tells you something about the distribution of edges. This generalizes to all Paley graphs that the second eigenvalue is essentially the, roughly the square root of the first. There are some examples of Paley graphs, P17, and the one on the left, as I promised at the beginning of the talk, is the witness that R44 is not 17, it's more than 17. Okay. So I drew it in two different ways. Um, there they are in general, a Paley graph on five vertices and so on. You can draw you can draw all of these things. And as I said, we know all their eigenvalues. And uh, so why do we want to know the eigenvalues of these pseudo-random graphs? We would like to use these in Ramsey theory. So in a deregular n-vertex graph, the number of independent sets uh, is n uh, of size n over d plus 1 is at least d plus 1 to the power of t. That's a trivial argument because you just pick a vertex and delete all its neighbors and repeat. And you don't run out of space if all you want is n over d plus 1 vertices. Not only that, uh, a disjoint union of cliques of order d plus 1 shows this is tight. So there's really not much you can do for counting these small independent sets, independent sets of size n over d plus 1 in a deregular graph. But in pseudo-random graphs, remarkably, it turns out you can actually do better if you count independent sets that are slightly bigger than this. That's going to be a key result. It was originally uh, proved in some form by Alon and Rodel. We uh, kind of got better constants, and we proved the following, that the number of independent sets of size, well, not n over d plus 1, but a little bit more. Right? We slide in a log n squared, though. So log n squared bigger than the trivial size independent set, the number of them is controlled by that number lambda. Right? It's no more than about lambda to the t. Right, so compare that to d to the t. When you count independent sets of size n over d plus 1, you're now dropping to lambda to the t when you count these independent sets that are slightly bigger. And once you know that, 
Let's do it in the Paley graph. Um, I didn't tell you quite what the lambda is, but it's something like root n, right? something like the square root of the number of vertices. And so if we apply this theorem just as is in the Paley graph, we get something like uh, square root n to the t uh, independent sets of size t. And we add one little ingredient, which is to sample vertices randomly in this Paley graph. Namely, sample vertices with probability inverse to the number of independent sets to the t. Right? So in this case would be that quantity there. And why do we do that? It's so that the expected number of independent sets of size t is small. Now the Paley graph is self-complementary, so we could do the same thing for cliques as for independent sets. And if you do that, um, then in fact, you get a subset of the Paley graph with about, say, root n times log n squared vertices, and no independent set of size t. And the computation tells you this gives you t times 2 to the t over 2 over 4e squared for the lower bound on uh, diagonal Ramsey numbers. So the advantage here over random graphs is you have far fewer random bits. All you're doing is sampling some vertices. You do not have to generate edges randomly. You already have the graph. It's a Paley graph. And so this, uh, I would ask... Uh, if this can be improved. And not only that, whether this can be de-randomized. This is long sought after, an exponential construction uh, in Ramsey theory. There's no known explicit exponential construction for RTT. So here we have little less randomness, but maybe there's a way of de-randomizing this since we know the graph, right? The edges are just quadratic residues. So I'll come back to that, but uh, let's to have a look at the triangle free graphs. Um, so again, you have these real eigenvalues of adjacency matrix, and the number of triangles is clearly the sum of the cubes of the eigenvalues, right? The trace of the cube of the adjacency matrix counts these things, and the adjacency matrix is diagonalizable. So you get the sum of the lambda i cubes, and it's zero if the graph is triangle free. If it's lambda pseudo random, we know the largest eigenvalue is d, and all the rest are most lambda in modulus. So if the graph is triangle-free, you get this inequality, relating the lambda value to d, as well as n. And so if you do that, well, the alain Bapana theorem shows you lambda can't be less than about root d, so root d is the best you could do, and if you had that, we'll call that optimal. A lambda pseudorandom graph with lambda about root d, we'll call that optimal. Then the preceding inequality tells you the best you can do is that d could be as big as n to the two-thirds and lambda n to the one-third. So that would be an optimal pseudorandom triangle-free graph. And in fact, these were constructed by Noga Alon, a beautiful construction of Noga Alon, and later by Coparty. Uh, and what do they give? Well, first of all, the proof involves some light uh, number theory, character sums. I won't say more about what the construction is. But here's the upshot. If you have, in general, an optimal pseudorandom KS free graph, then those are the parameters. You can just compute them in the same way we did with traces for triangles. If you had such an optimal pseudo-random graph, you would get the matching bound to the erdos sekeres theorem for the classical Ramsey numbers. So there is this polynomial of degree s minus 1 in t. And the proof of this, you already know. I gave it for the Paley graphs, which are, in some sense, optimal pseudo-random. You would just take your optimal pseudo-random graph, count the independent sets of a certain size in that graph, and then randomly sample vertices to destroy them all. Okay? It's that simple. That gives you the slower bound on, on Ramsey numbers. Okay. 
Now, I promised at the start something about R40, which would have been the first open case. Uh, we would have liked to execute this program to get R40. Unfortunately, you need an optimal pseudorandom K4 free graph. We tried hard to construct optimal pseudorandom K4 free graphs and failed. This is an extremely difficult problem for many reasons that we now know. It would imply some other solutions to some other difficult problems. So we were unable to construct an optimal pseudorandom K4 free graph. But of course, when you're defeated in mathematics, you don't give up and you continue. And that's what I'm going to do. It's not the end of the talk. I want to talk a little bit, bit about uh, a slightly different approach, uh, which I refer to as random blocks. Uh, this is really coming from early papers of uh, uh, Dudek and Rodel uh, in, some, in some form. But here's the general setup. I give you a bipartite graph let's say with parts A and B of sizes N and M. Uh, one thing I can do is I can take that graph uh, and define this thing which I'll call projection G pi. You take uh, the projection G pi of G, it should say onto A, right? So I'm going to push it down onto one side. Essentially what you do is join vertices of A with an edge when they have distance two in the bipartite graph. Right? So essentially you push the bipartite graph down onto one side. Take the square of the graph, if you like, and restrict it to A. So you can do that. And uh, for each vertex on the other side, you get a clique in this new graph, right? Because the neighborhood of a vertex on the other side is a clique in this graph. Okay. And if the graph is a some sort of point line incidence graph, which means it doesn't have any four cycles in it, um, then these so-called designated cliques are edge disjoint. Right. No two of these cliques can uh, share an edge. And I'll draw a picture. The next step we're going to do inside each designated clique, I'm going to take a random complete bipartite graph independently for each clique, and I'll call that G pi star. Okay, so now we have a random graph, and I'll call this the random block construction. And it, it turns out to be uh, much more useful than I originally thought. So here's the procedure that I've done so far, at least the first three steps. Here's a bipartite graph G. Take a typical vertex at the top, you get a clique at the bottom, right, in the distance two graph. So there you get all these cliques which come from vertices at the top. So now we throw the top part away. And then we want to make this graph G pi star, which means we're going to cut these things into complete bipartite graphs. That gives me a G pi star. I'm going to do one further step. I'm going to do the random sampling that I alluded to in pseudo random graphs before. I'm going to randomly sample vertices of this G pi star. So in here, of course, we uh, are doing these random complete bipartite graphs, and then we randomly sample. So two, two rounds of randomness going on there. So let me look at an example as to why we'd want to do this. Suppose the original bipartite graph does not contain what is called a one subdivision of K4. It's that picture, right? So you put a vertex inside every edge of a complete graph of order four. The reason to do that is that if you do this projection, then every K4 contains a triangle inside one of the designated cliques, right? That's because those four red vertices, their neighborhoods are designated cliques, which together do not make any K4. Okay. So when you do G pi star, you have a K4 free graph. In general, if you could do this for KS, you'd have a KS free graph, right? Because if you cut in half and make a bipartite graph inside each designated cliques, You've destroyed all the K4s. So you have a natural K4 free graph in this way. And so we're going to do our program starting with a special uh, bipartite graph, which is the bipartite incidence graph of something called a Hermitian unital coming from projective geometry. 
And this thing has no it's, it's one subdivision of K4 in the sense that I, I drew before. Um, this is also called the Onan or Pasha configuration in hypergraph theory. We then do the projection. So remember this uh, projection uh, uh, will contain K4s, but the triangles will be in designated cliques and we destroy them. So what we do um, is to show that even after you do all of that, you still have a pseudo random graph, but it's not pseudo random in terms of eigenvalues, unfortunately. It's pseudo random simply by using a martingale approach to show that the distribution of edges is what you need it to be. They have the right number of edges on large sets of vertices. We then use the method of containers with this random sampling to get our Ramsey graph for R4T. And so rather than go through the, all these martingales and uh, computations, I'm going to I'm going to ignore that. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what the starting graph is, this Hermitian unital. Um, so it's a set of points X, Y, Z in PG 2 Q squared that uh, satisfy um, this equation, right? So it's an equation over F Q squared. And that's the equation, that's it, okay? And we're gonna take the bipartite incidence graph of this structure. So the points are these, and the lines are the intersections of lines of the projective geometry with this set of points. And quite quickly, what you see if you do that is you get an M by N bipartite graph with some nice properties. This is a bipartite graph which can be input into the program which I mentioned on the preceding slide. And the miracle is that this Permission unital, unlike all unitals, but this particular one does not contain four lines in general position. And the four lines in general position correspond to that picture that I drew before, the one subdivision of K4. That's what they look like. Why are there no four lines in general position? We went to the original paper of Michael Onan from the 70s, which proves this. And I decided this can't be the way to prove it. No disrespect intended, but the proof was uh, extremely long and group theoretic. And uh, sometimes laziness pays off. You want a short proof, you want an easy proof, and this pushed us to find a short proof using linear algebra. So there's a very short proof using linear algebra. I'm not going to go through it. It's simply a determinant computation that shows that that configuration is absent from the Hermitian unital. And that's it. Okay. So that's the sketch for R4T. Um, I do not want to go over time, so I'm hoping to impinge on your time for five more minutes. So let me mention a related problem to which these methods can be successfully applied. So first of all, I should mention that these methods give a lot of other new lower bounds on Ramsey numbers, such as cycle complete graph, Ramsey numbers, and various others. Um, here I'm rather going to talk about these Erdős rogers functions. These were introduced in the 60s by Erdős and Rogers, and they are just generalizations of Ramsey numbers. So what are these Erdős rogers functions? Well, if I give you two graphs f and g, what I'm seeking is the largest f free subgraph of any G free graph on N vertices, right? So I give you a G free graph with N vertices and I'm asking for an induced F free subgraph. How big can you guarantee an F free subgraph? So you'll observe that F K2 KT is Ramsey numbers, right? If F is K2, and G is KT, what am I asking? I'm asking for the largest independent set in a KT free N vertex graph. That's precisely Ramsey. Okay, so this is generalizing Ramsey numbers and there've been an enormous number of works uh, on these Erdős rogers functions, most recently due to Tim Gowers and Oliver Janza, 
Oliver Jans and Benny Sudakov. Um, I'm only going to be able to mention some salient results. One of them is this result due to Wolfowitz that says that if you look at f of k3, k4, it's at most about n to the half times poly log n. So what is this again? Let's refresh. It's saying in any k4 free graph, how large a k3 free subgraph can I find? What this does is it says you might not be able to guarantee more than about n to the half poly log n, right? That's what this upper bound says. There is a graph where there is no larger k3 free subgraph, and yet the graph is k4 free. This turns out to be almost tight because there's a very simple lower bound that gives you n to the half. Namely, in fact, fksks plus 1 is at least square root n minus 1. Uh, that's a very easy proof. Um, you simply say that if a graph has maximum degree d, then it has an independent set of size at least n over d plus 1. But the neighborhood of a vertex of degree d in a ks plus 1 free graph is ks free. And so you just balance those two quantities and you get root a. Okay? In fact, you can do a bit better using results of Shearer. Uh, and so this determines up to some poly logs what is this quantity. And there were lots of improvements by Erdős and Rödel and others. Um, but recently, we managed to show it's at most n to the half times log n using precisely the methods of this uh, talk that I alluded to before. So n to the half times log n to the 1. And uh, I should point out, this is a very strange thing that happens, that uh, this should say f of f ks. I don't know why I said s bigger than 3 there. Um, what I wanted to say, though, is that this is particular to k4 free graphs. I could have asked the same thing for f of f k3. So in a triangle free graph, What's the largest F free subgraph? Remarkably, it turns out to be always n to the half plus little o1. Doesn't matter what F is. That's a real surprise because the moment you consider K4, it could be anything. This number is very hard to determine. Okay, so I'm gonna just end with a couple of open problems. I think that our bound for these erdos rogers functions is tight. n to the half times log n to the power of 1 is the right answer. And in particular, there's one little problem that comes up that uh, should be answered. Very simple little problem. Um, if you have every neighborhood of a graph induce a bipartite graph, can you find a triangle-free subgraph that's better than the size of a largest independent set that you can guarantee by some omega of d going to infinity? So that's one open problem. Um, we managed to actually find a very short proof, a couple of lines long, of this uh, I. Ty Komlosh Pins Spencer Semerady proof with my student Chase Wilson that gives the right answer for triangle-free subgraphs, but does not answer the pre preceding question. We hope it will in the end, but we, we don't know yet. This is a, a very short proof. Uh, if you're interested, I can say something about it. Open problem two is to count independent sets better than the bound I gave in this talk. So in fact, instead of counting independent sets of size n log n squared over d, perhaps we can count independent sets of size n log n over d. If you could do this, you would determine the order of magnitude of R4t. It would kill the logarithmic factors. And then finally, you must ask about R5t, which we are thinking hard about. We would like, in PG2q cubed, to find a set of q to the four points and q to the six lines of size q each with no five in general position. If you can do that, you can get R5t. There's the extra line that you want to avoid. We don't know how to do this. There have been computer searches to try to do it so far without success. But it appears one should look in PG2Q cubed for R5t. 
Thank you very much. I will end my talk there. Jack, thank you very much for a lovely talk. Um, so do we have any questions? Maybe, actually I could ask, you mentioned this result on triple systems, whether you have a short proof. Yes. Can you say a word or two about that? Uh, yes, I can. Um, so uh, there is a short proof uh, in triangle free graphs that gives a lower bound of n log d over d roughly for independent sets. This is a fairly well-known now uh, result going back to Shearer. There's a number of different uh, uh, phrasings of, of, of that, uh, including a phrasing uh, coming from uh, statistical physics. Inspired by those uh, ideas, we try to do the same thing in triple systems. So an independent set means a set with no carrying no triples in it. Okay, what, and the what, question is, how do we do that? How do we find such an independent set? Yes. What does locally sparse mean? Just to... So locally sparse, you can take that to mean linear. No two triples intersect in two points. And so the idea is, what you'd like to do is uniformly sample an independent set and show that on average it's big. That does not work. We cannot do what Shearer did. And in fact, we found that Shearer asked about it. How do you do this for triples? So it turns out we need some inspiration from statistical physics. Uh, I'm not very good at using the words of statistical physics. I know that if I say low temperature limits and things like that, I'll be caught out. So I won't. Um, but it's in that direction that you, you sample independent sets with a very carefully chosen uh, probability measure. One that allows you to get rid of certain upper tails that really bother you in the original proof of Shearer. Uh, but once you do that, once you have the measure, you just write down the, the expected value of uh, the size of the independent sets and it gives uh, this answer. And it works for our uniform hypergraphs as well gives the right answer there too. So that is a, a preprint. We're not, we're, we haven't published it yet. We're, we're, it's it's uh, in preparation. Thanks for asking. And then measure something like sets of size D, sets of size K have weight lambdas of the K or something, that sort of. Ah, uh, no, actually, what? that doesn't work. What we actually had to do is say that, a, yeah, so the weight of a set of size K turns out to be proportional to the number of pairs in that set, which are in a triple. Uh, and it's not even quite that, it's, 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 a, it's a little subtle. So yeah, you have to really be careful with the, with the, with the weight that you choose. Uh, we're hoping that it's going to give one, once we've optimized everything. So n root log d over root d, which would then almost uh, match random triple systems. Okay, nice. Other questions? Okay, um, so I'll maybe stop the recording at this point and then we can thank uh, all our muse and thank Jacques again for a great talk.